This is funny. I am so tired of my story of punk. <laughs> I've heard it so many fucking times. If you haven't seen the movie or bought the book, that's your problem. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear, because you haven't dined out on it as much as I have, Paul. Dined. Your story. Um, dined. Died. Dined. Died. You have died on it, but dined. So what do you remember? Of, what's your first memory of 76? In 76, to me, what I remember in a funny sort of way is everything becoming black and white for a moment. Almost like a weird pause before the, the chaos that, and, the, and the excitement that happened. And it was, it was a series of things like... Um, the Dr. Feelgood album, the Patti Smith album. These kind of, it was, it's like everything was being stripped down so that there was a weird kind of moment where everything went a little bit monochrome, as if, as if the calm was down, because everything else was quite excessive in terms of uh, the mainstream idea of what, what music was. What I noticed as well, is, and, and I've noticed more and more in hindsight about punk, is that uh, although over the 25, 30 years that it's been talked about and, and exhumed, and become a mainstream thing. People now know when they talk about punk, you know, it's something that really is, is sort of on top of the pops and in Heat magazine. But what it really was in 76, I guess, was based on, a, on the fact that a lot of people at that time really, really loved their music, funnily enough. They loved their music. And the first kind of hints you have had of people responding to punk, what became punk music and became something so tremendous was just people noticing a music that tapped into the kind of music that they really loved. So th at that time, you were looking outside to find your music. You were looking to German music, like Faust and Can. You were looking to, you know, strange American music to find, you know, e exciting things. You were looking to avant-garde jazz. You were looking to Captain Beefheart. And, and, and the first response I remember making to punk, to what became known as punk, was that it was just fantastic music that seems to sort of fit together everything in terms of the music that you were listening to and wanting and craving. And the New York thing started a hint at that when Richard Hell and Patti Smith started a, to emerge. I mean the, the, I, Tom I mean, Verlaine. The Patti Smith album was kind of... That was the black and white thing. You that see, was central was with the Mapplethorpe image on the cover. This extraordinary image and there was a little bit of facial hair on the top of her upper lip which caused Clive Davis at Arista tremendous concern. Because, of course, it's, it's, it's still true to this day, really, that, that female images are meant to be pretty, they're meant to be candified and pastely. And if only Clive Davis could have seen what's happened to Frida Kahlo in the last two years. <laughs> yeah. But it was, an incredibly, it, it was an incredibly powerful image, and it's an image that's never, never dated, really, because it, it subverted all those um, ideas of what the record industry wanted to do. It's a white shirt, women. isn't it? It's a white shirt. It's, it's dressed as a man. She looks like she's the, you know, the result of, of, of Keith Richards fucking Arthur Rambo. It's an incredibly potent image, and that kind of set things up. It was like a, it was like a weird palate cleanser for what was about to happen. But you, you muddied the water for me because you mentioned Dr. Feelgood, mm. and that seemed to me to be from a sort of pub rock era, which was sort of 75. And but what they, were, what they were doing, suddenly, there were these three-minute songs that were incredibly brisk and, and frisky and, and, and stripped back, and the guitar playing was not that far from, say, Andy Gill's of Gang of Four. I mean, it, it, you know, if you listen to Gang of Four, in a way, they were like, you know, a Marxist Dr. Feelgood. I mean, in another way, they were like a, a kind of a, a non-sexist free, but they don't like me saying that, so I, I uh, tend to not bring that up in public. But, but those things were going on just from a musical point of view. You know, those, that, those of us that loved our music, that were listening, you know, to, to Brian Eno albums and David Bowie, and, and we were, that, that, that thing that started to happen very quickly, which was a rejection of cliché that I think was so important about what punk did. And it was a rejection of musical cliché that became a political thing, that you rejected cliché because it was clogging up the world and it was making the world a routine and, and, and habit-forming. And, and punk, you know, 76, I just you know, remember for me, just suddenly everything changed. And, and, and because living, up obviously, in Stockport, it was fairly monochrome anyway. It was incredible to have these things for a moment confirm it. And then suddenly we all, we all went to see the Sex Pistols at the Lesser Free Trade Hall and colour came. Even though it wasn't colour in a way, it seemed like colour. Mm. And it was colour as a metaphor for, for imaginative excitement. One of the arguments, if you look at the... This is related to the exhibition upstairs, which is wonderful, is that punk came out of Bromley. Did punk come out of Bromley? Susie came out of Bromley. Susie came out of Bromley. And uh, I remember seeing Susie in the Oaks in Chalton, <laughs> yes. Rob Gretton's club. The great Rob Gretton, who I've noticed upstairs, obviously produced the worst fanzine of all time. I'd, I'd forgotten that. Was it Manchester Reigns or something? With his biro uh, and the kind of things. That it, was just, it is beautifully the worst fanzine ever. And Rob Gretton put on the Oaks, and some great things happened at the Oaks very, very early on. I once carried Wayne County. I was a roadie there for Wayne County. Yeah, and the Slits came up yes, very, very yes. early on, almost before they played in London, it seemed. And, and Susie came up. 
And that, 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 these were incredible moments because they were so glamorous and, that, and there was something you could touch. Whereas all the music you'd be going to see from Manchester point of view, making the journey for me on the 92 into Manchester Free Trade Hall, Pink Floyd, Fanny, T-Rex, David Bowie, you know, they, they seemed remote. It seemed something so far removed from your actual tangible experience and suddenly you were going to see Susie or the Slits and you could touch their shoes as they played. And they played a music that seemed almost kind of... Um, it, well, for me, because I was a big fan of free jazz, it seemed like free jazz. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to see the Slits or Susie at the Oaks in Chalton and be screaming at the top of my head, it sounds like Ornette Coleman. And a, a lot of people thought I was completely insane, but there was something about the music that was so liberating because they were, they were, they were all in their own zone. You know, I remember Kenny Morris of the Banshees would be playing drums here. Seven would be playing bass there. They'd all be in different worlds. Somehow it fitted and yet didn't fit, and it was a complete revolution just in terms of sound. At that point... You were doing the idea that you'd do it yourself. Were you doing sh shy talk at that point? No, I was. Do there was a, there was a shy talk, but I can't remember who did shy talk. Now, do you remember who did shy talk? Man? Somebody up Levenshume. There he is. He was up in Levenshume, wasn't it? Shy talk. There you go. So I remember shy talk, but I, what I did, I did a fanzine that was actually. Girl. It was called Out There. Out there. Out there. That's right. And I got it. I've got a copy of it somewhere. It, yeah. I've got seven copies. It was... <laughs> <laughs> what? Is it? Oh, I didn't see it. But what I did, it's funny, I, um, I did it on glossy paper and I got it typeset at a local printer's. It cost me £100. And I remember getting a, a letter from Mark Perry, who had been doing sniffing glue in London. And it had got a fairly good review from Julie Birchall, oddly enough, in the NME, who called me Modest Young, Paul Morley. So I tried to change my name to Modest Young for a while, but it didn't take off. <laughs> and, 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 and Mark Perry sent me a letter, slagging me off, saying it looked like Vogue, because obviously everyone else was doing the, the, the cut-ups and the, and the yeah, Xeroxing. I did, the, I did the... Well, I like to think of it as glamorous and sexy, but it, well, did look, it looked a, bit, a little bit gay, didn't it? That's while goodness. we're talking about sniffing glue, let's just have one bit oh, of... there's anything wrong with that. One bit of cultural theory... Sniffing Glue had that famous page where they said, here are three chords, go away and play. Mm. And in fact, that is complete nonsense because in real punk, and if you look at any of the early punk bands, and for this I pay tribute to Mr. Mitchell's partner, Mr. Riley, for explaining this to me, you couldn't play E, A and B7 because that was too complicated. All you could do was play an F bar chord. And I'm sure there's at least three people in this room who have learnt the guitar and you will all know that when you learn the guitar, you learn C, F, and G7, E, A, and B7, which was what Sniffing Glue said you had to learn, and that's the one, four, five t tonal dominant system. And it means your brain is tight-roped and sort of straight-jacketed into a kind of musical system. And in fact, as Mr. Riley explained so, so eloquently, suddenly you had a bar F shape, and it goes up and down the fretboard and goes anywhere, and it frees melody. And you look, you look at Bernard Sumner in the mid-80s, Bernard's arms, hands, still going up and down the fretboard. And that was, I always think McLaren in, in the Pistols, which I think is what punk was all about. Fuck this exhibition, fuck everybody else, including Joe Strummer, who was a very nice man, but it was about the Pistols, it was about John. And I think McLaren wanted to create the Bay City Rollers of Outrage. Mm. He wanted to be a group that was number one, the biggest thing in the country, just because they were disgusting. And in fact, art, culture, society completely subverted Malcolm because the pistols were correctly the most valuable thing in the world. Or well, do you think I overestimate the pistols? Well, you, you said your stories, you, you, you've sort of been told to death, but I, I'm, I'm bored stiff with it. I'm, yes. I'm still quite interested, actually, how you popped up there and why you were so turned on by it. Because you didn't look well, like you would have been, and you didn't sort of. No, because no one I trusted you at the time. I'm a tip. Well, remember, this is, this is the Liz Naylor theory of punk which is that punk was hippies' revenge. Far from being to kill the hippies, it was actually hippies, second-generation hippies like me, who grew up in the late 60s with that wonderful dream. It was wonderful music, the walls were coming down, revolution in the street, and then suddenly, you know, 1970 came, suddenly, you know, I, I remember going to see Steve Stills. I 